This is a replica of where it all happened, Marilyn Monroe's bedroom in Brentwood. It's important to understand where it happened because this has great bearing on the different accounts of what happened. Over the years, many different accounts of Marilyn's death have emerged. The official story is based on the word of two people who were in Marilyn's bedroom that final night. Her psychiatrist, Ralph Greenson, and Marilyn's housekeeper, Eunice Murray. Their accounts are riddled with inconsistencies, not the least of which are the various times when things were supposed to have happened. Their stories have also changed dramatically over time. Now, the first person to notice that something was fishy was a police sergeant named Jack Clemens. His story begins at 4.25 in the morning when police were finally officially called. At 4.25 in the morning on August 5th, 1962, Jack Clemens, a veteran police sergeant working the graveyard shift, received a phone call that would change his life. It was from Maryland psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, She's dead. Greenson told him that Marilyn was dead. It will be right there. What's the address? This is 8L10. On the way to Marilyn's house, I radioed the dispatcher to have 8L20, Sergeant I unknown, meet me at the location. I also requested 8A5, the patrol car in the area, to that location to handle traffic. A few minutes later, Clemens arrived at 12305 Fifth Helena Drive to begin his investigation. What he would find there would shock him and ultimately end his career in law enforcement. I went to the door and Mrs. Murray admitted me. She showed me into Marilyn's bedroom. Marilyn was laying face down on the bed. Her face was buried in a pillow. The best way I can describe it, it was a soldier's position when she was face down. Who found the body? I did. I asked um, who discovered the scene. Mrs. Murray said that she did. Well, tell me about it. This is Mrs. Murray's story to me. She said... Uh, when I went to bed about 10 o'clock, I saw the light under Marilyn's door, and I just thought she was talking on the telephone to her friends. And I went to bed. About midnight, I got up and went down the hall to the bathroom, and the light was still on. So I knocked on her door, and she, she didn't answer. So I was concerned, and I called Dr. Greenson. He came over, and we, we couldn't get in. Carolyn, wake up! So he had to come through the window. Dr. Greenson, who lived a short distance away, came over as soon as he could, and broke a window outside gained entry into Marilyn's bedroom and found her dead on the bed. This is her story to me, at any rate. Okay, Mrs. Murray told me that Dr. Greenson entered the room, saw the pills, and found the body. At which time he called Dr. Engelberg, who was Marilyn's regular physician, who also lived in an immediate neighborhood, and he came over and pronounced her dead. Now, according to this story that I'm receiving at this time, this is all occurring shortly after midnight. And I got the phone call at 4.25 a.m. And if this story is true, this means that these people are staying in this house for four hours with a dead body. This happened at midnight. So uh, I asked him, well, why did you not call sooner? Why did you let us know sooner? And no one wanted to answer me. They tried to ignore me. But I thought that was important, so I pressed for an answer. And finally, Dr. Greenson spoke up. We can't do anything until we're... Incidentally, Dr. Greenson did most of the talking when I was there. You have to understand, she's... He, Dr. Greenson said, we had to get permission from the publicity department of the studio before we could notify anybody. Now, that is rank nonsense. That's not an answer. Uh, certainly no truth to it. Now, 70 pills commit suicide. Suicide, Officer Clements. Make sure you write that down. The whole place was very neat. Uh, there was no, no loose ends around. The bed itself was very neat. Uh, only uh, the sheet was on the bed over Marilyn's body. Um, there's a lot of reports about her having a phone in her hand. There was, there was not when I was there. 
not when I was there. And the whole house, or the part I saw the house, everything had been picked up. At 3.30 a.m., alerted, she says, by some instinct, Mrs. Murray noticed the phone cord under Marilyn's door. Usually, Marilyn disconnected the phone at night. So, of course, I was alarmed. I called Dr. Greenson. This is essentially the story Mrs. Murray has told for 23 years. I went around to the front of the house before Dr. Greenson arrived. The bedroom curtains were closed. She went to get a poker. Turning the curtains back, I saw Marilyn lying on the bed, nude, and I was just alarmed. Not long after 3.30, Dr. Greenson arrived. He went round to the side of the house, broke the bedroom window, and entered. He wrote later, I could see that Marilyn was no longer living. There she was, bare shoulders exposed, the phone clutched fiercely in her right hand. Marilyn's own physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg, was summoned, and the police called at 4.25. However, this version has to be wrong in key respects. First, new evidence shifts events to a much earlier point in the evening. At 11 p.m. or earlier, Marilyn's press agent, Arthur Jacobs, and Natalie, his wife, attending a Henry Mancini concert in the Hollywood Bowl, were interrupted by a worrying message. About three quarters of the way through the concert, someone came to our box and said, Arthur, come quickly. And he didn't realize, and he said, Marilyn is dead or she's on the point of death. The official police report accepts that Mrs. Murray's call to Dr. Greenson was at 3.35 a.m. However, the first police officer on the scene that night says he got quite a different story from Mrs. Murray. It all happened much earlier. It was uh, immediately after midnight. And Dr. Greenson was present when she was telling you that? Yes, he was. And he didn't disagree? No, he did not. Mrs. Murray told us much the same thing. She actually became concerned about Marilyn earlier. It was probably about midnight. I asked them very pointedly why it took from midnight, approx approximately midnight or 12.30 till about 4.30 to call the police. I'm standing looking at two doctors, both of whom know that this is a, what we call a coroner's case. They know they have to notify the police and it take, takes them four hours to get around to it. Mrs. Murray now says she can't remember why she didn't call Dr. Greenson until 3.30. That I don't know. I'll have to admit, I don't know. 85. So what happened in the missing four hours? By this time, it was widely rumored that she was having an affair with Kennedy's brother, Bobby, the United States Attorney General, whom she'd met through Peter Lawford, the actor, and Kennedy's brother-in-law. And certainly, Kennedy was in the habit of visiting her in California. He came to the house one day, and I opened the door for him, and Marilyn was out in the garden. He went out there, and then he stayed about a half an hour or so and left. And... Um, she came to me immediately and she said, isn't he nice? He said, say thank you to the lovely lady who opened the door. Do you think she was very much in love with him? I think that she appreciated having him as one of her admirers. But I don't know more than that. I couldn't, as a layman, couldn't describe her as depressed. But I know she had many worries and this particular day she was not lively and enthusiastic she was very quiet was she in the mood of a person who would later deliberately take her own life i doubt that very much and she had told me that one of the very first things to warn me that if she ta takes sedation which she did every night sometimes she's apt to forget and would take a second dose too soon and this is what she had to be very careful about so that was the first thing that I was concerned about after she, as she died that that probably had happened when she went to the telephone. The tapes appear to shed an interesting light on Miner's theory. But doctor, I don't understand they speak to Brew about enemas. Most of the actresses I know use them, even those who won't admit it. Marilyn speaks candidly about enjoying enemas for health reasons and for sexual pleasure. And she speaks of receiving enemas from her housekeeper. This has led to murder theory three. Miner suggests that Eunice Murray, acting perhaps on behalf of others, and for reasons which remain unknown, may have given Marilyn the fatal enema. He emphasizes the fact 
that when the police arrived at the house on the Sunday morning, they found the washing machine running. If she had administered the retention enema and some of the fluid escaped, soiling the sheets, then it becomes understandable that she's operating the washing machine to destroy that evidence. 